Well, good afternoon, everyone in the room and good afternoon, everyone online. It is this is the Education Skills Service Transformation Committee of Wednesday, the 8th of November 2023. I can't believe we're so close to Christmas already. Time is flying by, isn't it? Uh, so we I haven't had any apologies for absence. Gareth, have you? No, me, Chair. Not yet, anyway. Right. Anyone from anywhere else? No. OK, oh, there's Lyndon. Good to see. Right. OK, so we will crack on with item number two, disclosures of personal and prejudicial interest. Do we have any? No, we don't. Number three is the minutes of the last meeting. Can I go through them uh, page by page, please? Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. And if the committee members are content, I will approve and sign the minutes as a correct record. Are we happy? Thank you, Lyndon. Thank you, Bev. Thank you, Sandra. Lovely. OK, so moving swiftly on to agenda item number four, right schools in right places. Can I pass on to Councillor Robert Smith, the Cabinet Member for Education and Skills, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. And can I thank the, the officers, Kelly in particular, for Kelly Small in particular, for drawing um, pulling together the report that's uh, tabled in front of us for discussion this afternoon. Um, this will be, I hope, uh, the beginning of a discussion about the school estate, how we move forward and what we're looking for uh, in future. I was challenged in the Cosign and Working Men's Club, better known as the Brighton Road to some of us. You know, what's the, how many schools are you going to close? They said, well, I said, you know, there is no hit list. Read the report. There is no list of schools in this report. That's not what this is about. It's about looking at the principles we need to be working to, how we want our schools to look in future, what function do we want them to perform, how they can be organised and, and governed. And we, we know there are some innovative proposals coming about already in response to local circumstances in some parts of Swansea. And I mean, that's the type of thing we, we need to consider moving forward. It's how we share the school estate to make sure that uh, we we get value for money and, and that other services are able uh, to be delivered from our schools if that's appropriate and if that's what meets community needs. And it's how we in, use the school estate to enable the curriculum. We've got a new curriculum in Wales. That curriculum is going to evolve over time. Um, and of course, not just the, the uh, pre the um, three to uh, six to 14 curriculum. We're also talking about 14 to 16 and post 16. So all of these factors need to be in the mix uh, and they all have a bearing on how our school estate will look like. Now, that's not to say, of course, that there won't be changes. Of course, there'll be changes. Um, buildings uh, have a lifespan. Um, buildings uh, come and go. But our provision of, of, of education in Swansea and the quality of what is delivered is what's important and, and what uh, needs to drive us moving forward. So I think those those are words of an introduction and I know Helen and uh, Kelly will, will then take us through the, through the report, Chair. Lovely. Thank you very much, Robert. It's a, it's a great foundation to build upon. Helen? Thank you, Chair. Um, so the concept of a school provision plan as outlined in item four of um, the pack in front of you today is not a new concept at all. Indeed, um, it's a, a piece of refreshed work in, in some respects, but it's very timely because it will support decision making um, for the uh, school estate in the future, as Councillor Smith has outlined. So what we're trying to achieve is that sense of transparency, which was mentioned the last time we spoke about this um, plan. So having a school provision plan is absolutely uh, key for the public and for stakeholders to understand really the component parts that form uh, the final decision making. So indeed, this um, significant transformation agenda is um, likely to happen in terms of um, the, the good things that happen in terms of building new schools, but sometimes more difficult decisions may need to be made given some of the demographics, some of the census information we're seeing. So this is probably something that will serve us well in the next 10 to maybe 25 years. So it's a, you know, it's a medium to long term uh, plan. 
So the school um, provision plan here will detail and dovetail really well with some of the existing plans around sustainable communities for learning. So sustainable communities for learning is the new word for band A or band B or band C. Uh, there isn't uh, a concept of band C anymore. It's called sustainable communities for learning. So what we're trying to achieve here is a sense of consolidation of sustainable clusters or communities of learning across Swansea um, so that we can sustain ourselves in the future. We know that resources are scarce these days, so we need to make sure that we've got um, the number of, of schools, the right number of schools in the right places across Swansea. So I believe um, that the suggested components outlined uh, that Kelly's going to talk to us in detail about uh, this afternoon are um, sensible and suitable, really, as part of this um, plan, this provision plan for schools. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Helen. So we can pass on to Kelly now for, for the report itself. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, hopefully everyone's got the report in front of them so I can refer to the relevant uh, paragraphs as I go through. Um, so the first section there, uh, the background, um, was just reminding us um, that we did in our last session look at the proposal uh, to produce um, a, a sort of school organisation plan to cover, we were talking at, at the time we were a 10 year period. Um, and obviously, as Harley mentioned, it does need to dovetail with other plans that are there, uh, in particular, the strategic outline programme that we're working on um, under the Sustainable Communities for Learning. So that will be setting out our store then really on what um, you know, sort of changes we want to make to our school stock involving uh, capital uh, building and capital support um, over the coming years. Um, any plan that we obviously produce would need to be considered by Cabinet at some point as well. Um, so, so this is the second of three sessions that we were going to look at through our committee um, today. Um, and this is just sort of another stage forward really into the production of this plan that I've tentatively called you know, the school provision plan. I was looking for something that didn't have um, an acronym that's already been used, to be honest with you. So hopefully everyone's happy with that uh, as, as a description of what we're looking for. So um, over on to paragraph uh, 2.2 then. Um, so our plan really is going to be a contextual document and needs to draw conclusions about the need to add or remove school places within the city and county of Swansea. Um, and once adopted, then that plan can help the council and parents. Everyone know, as, as Helen said, that transparency of, of where we are and what we want to do with our, our school stock. Um, I think it's going to be really important going forward that we do have a document to refer to. So, for example, when we are looking, um, you know, at the moment we're out for consultation with our special schools, you know, when we do in statutory proposals like that, that we do have a document to refer to that will say, you know, as per our plan, you know, this is in line with with what we've we've agreed um, as the way forward for our schools in Swansea. Um, also, when we're looking at the um, Sustainable Communities for Learning uh, programme, you know, and the, and the, the, the SOP, the School Organisation um, Strategic Operational Plan that we're going to put forward as well, having this to support it, I think is going to be really helpful going forward. So uh, on to paragraph 2.3. So the plan uh, could be a key reference document, as we mentioned. And it would run in a parallel timeline. So even though we mentioned last time a 10 year period, I think what I'm proposing now is if it's nine years, which would which would fit in then with the nine years of the of the strategic outline programme. So that programme has to be refreshed every three years. So we could look at refreshing the data that supports our plan every three years as well. So the principles would be the same, but the, the data could be refreshed um, every three years um, in line with those waves in the programme. Um, so um, I think when we're looking at, uh, like I said, statutory proposals that will fall out of the, the strategic outline programme, no doubt. Um, again, like I said, it, having that reference back to a plan that's been approved is going to be um, you know, really helpful for us. So, for example, if we're looking at you know creating a new school, having a you know maximum size of school or a minimum size of school that we can we can refer to will will help. Um, so under paragraph 2.4, um, what we'd be looking at there, um, we, we, it's coming back to you on the 24th of January with a draft of that plan, of the, the, the plan. And then um, I consider possibly taking it to cabinet around about the same time then the strategic outline um, programme is going to be approved as well, which around about February 2024. So they can sort of sit in parallel with each other going through the system. 
Uh, so hopefully that timeline will, will be acceptable. So um, 2.5, I think co-construction of anything at the moment is, is, you know, just the way forward, isn't it? So um, we do have the quality and education QED programme board. We've got officers on that group from education and corporate building services. They are the, that's the key group that we always refer to when we're looking at school organisation. So I think um, co-construction with that group is going to be uh, critical. Um, and also engagement with schools as well, just so that they are aware of what we're doing and, and um, you know, what we're looking to try and do with the plan. So um, we do have representative head teachers um, from uh, Acker and Scash, as we call them, so the primary and secondary groups. So we're hoping we can perhaps get some uh, head teacher representatives to help us through the process with that. So on to section three, then the contents of the plan. Um, I've given some suggested contents uh, in the report. So paragraph uh, 321, um, number of pupils on roll is obviously going to be key going forward uh, with anything that we do. I mentioned in the last uh, session of this committee that I came to about the falling birth rate within Swansea. Um, so we do need to keep a, a, a keen eye on that, but also we're noting the high inward migration. And that does impact on schools in particular that are um, linked to um, the university and where university students um, are living and the, and the children of those students, particularly from abroad, um, and hospital workers as well, uh, particularly those that are coming from abroad to work in, a, in our hospitals. And what we're finding is that's having an impact on some schools in Swansea, not, not all. Um, and, and sort of more heavily weighted to our faith schools as well. So, so there is a, a change in sort of cohort because of that inward migration. Um, looking at pupil numbers as well, I think trends are going to be really important to note, um, particularly looking at the um, move, which we are obviously sort of supporting through our uh, Welsh Education Strategic Plan as well, our WESP, um, the move from English to Welsh medium as well. So it's just keeping an eye on all of those stats and seeing where we need to be planning for the, the pupils of, our, of the future in Swansea. Uh, I'm suggesting here looking at, as well as the trends, looking at, I think Helen mentioned earlier, about the geographical areas as well, and looking at sort of clusters of schools and, and how um, the, the, the pupil numbers will affect those clusters. Um, obviously, we don't, you know, have the crystal ball yet. Uh, the council hasn't managed to, to buy one of those for us. But, you know, we do the best we can with the pupil projections and we do um, do retrospective analysis uh, to see how accurate they are. So, we, you know, we, we're pretty good with, with the trends in the main and the, and the um, pupil projections. So under three to two. I think identifying uh, an appropriate size of a school is going to be important as well, uh, rather than it being, you know, sort of an unidentified um, number and size in there. So, um, you know, there's going to be a number of factors that are going to look at that. So it's not just about the, the pupil numbers, really. It's about whether the um, delivery of education uh, can be maintained, particularly under the new curriculum for Wales as well. So, you know, we've got good schools of all sizes in Swansea, you know, at the moment. Um, but some smaller schools could potentially struggle, you know, with um, sort of financial viability, possibly more than anything, and the sort of breadth of experience that they need there. So it's not to say that we can't have small schools, but perhaps it's a different way of working with, with some of our small schools. So I've noted there the audit commission did indicate um, that the primary, a primary school should ideally be no less than 90 pupils, secondary school without a sixth form at least 600 pupils in a secondary school with a sixth form, at least 700 pupils. So there is a, a sort of guide we can start to refer back to that's been published. But what I'm thinking here is that we, we do need to have those discussions with the KWD board, with our schools, with our school improvement team officers, and sort of tease out really where for Swansea we think, um, you know, that, that size of school should be. Um, then under 323, three, you know, looking at total numbers as well. And I've mentioned that about the, the, the difference, the split between English medium, Welsh medium and faith. And I think that needs to be clear and looking at the trends as well over the years and how those are changing between those different sectors. So under 324, we, um, I was looking there at the location of housing developments and strategic sites within the LDP. So that can you know, change our um, population and where our population go to school. Uh, sort of, you know, if we have to establish a new school within a, a large um, a housing development area, then that could move pupils from other um, schools into that, that housing development and that school. Um, we do again analyse the data that's available to us. We do find a lot of pupils tend to recycle within an area if there's a new housing development, but it will depend on the size. We've got some pretty big ones in our LDP. Um, possibly you picked up on the news this morning, though, um, 
companies like Persimmon are, are looking at perhaps stepping down a little bit on the number of houses that they're going to be delivering. And I think there was a third that was mentioned this morning for Persimmon, for example. So when we've got our LDP sites and we're looking at new new schools, um, usually there's a trigger point. So when house X has been delivered, that's the point where they would look to deliver a school or where they would look to give us a contribution towards school buildings. So it's it's sort of, you know, when are they going to actually reach that trigger point? So it is going to be a little bit of um, sort of trying to sort of preempt what's going, to, what's going to be coming from some of these developments. Um, and some of them would potentially require a statutory notice under the school organisation code. So it's trying to get the timing right between, um, you know, when you go to consult on creating new schools and the school being delivered. Uh, so under 325, uh, parental choice. Um, that can affect numbers on roll as well. I've mentioned previously about schools um, having to admit up to their admission number, which is uh, related to the capacity of the school. So even if those pupils don't live within the catchment area, if there's a place and a parent wants their child to attend that place, then they get accepted into the school. So understanding those trends as well in the plan, I think, is going to be critical. And we do um, gather information on which pupils live in and out of, of catchment area so we can see if there's a, you know, sort of a common sort of thread going through on that. So 326 then, um, I'm sort of suggesting there that maybe we could look at if there's um, a school that's lost or gained more than a percentage of, of roll over a period of time, uh, suggesting potentially sort of 10% over a two year period, maybe that could review some sort of um, trigger review of accommodation potentially for that school, you know, sort of whether, you know, do we look, need to look at, is there something we need to add on to that school or, you know, take some accommodation away or do, you know, change of use. So for example, um, third party use of a, of a school site if there's surplus capacity. So again, that's something we could tease out. Uh, 327 then, um, it's worth noting that not all pupils are educated in schools. You know, there are um, a number of pupils educated in a pupil referral unit and indeed those educated at home. So I think looking at the whole cohort of pupils in Swansea, whether they're in our, our sort of maintained schools or not um, over time will be interesting. And I think particularly if we look back over the COVID years and, uh, and, and prior to, you know, and beyond that to see what's happened to those trends. And three to eight then, turnover of pupils. I've mentioned earlier about um, students coming from you know, the university in particular. We've noted that there are a number that will come on sort of short courses um, to Swansea. Uh, our funding is all based on January and the January Plask. If those pupils started a school after the January Plask and the short course ends before the next January Plask, then we don't get any funding for them. So it's just trying to recognise where that's happening and where that churn of pupils is in some of our schools. So section 3.3 .3 then is looking at capacity and surplus capacity. So every school has a capacity calculation um, every calculated every year. Um, with So we, we check with the schools what the usage of this school um, classrooms and things is going to be. So that capacity then, when we compare that to the number of pupils on roll, we'll identify if there's any um, oversubscription or any surplus capacity. Surplus capacity does come with a cost. You know, it is an empty space that the school has to maintain, heat, clean, you know, repairs and maintenance. Um, so we do need to keep an eye and, and record, I think, in the plan, those surplus spaces. And 3.3, uh, again, looking at do we identify a trigger point where we could review use of the school um, if there is a, you know, a level of super, surplus capacity, a high level of surplus capacity. So again, the QED board, you know, we could go through that board and, and see if we can come up with a, a trigger point. So section 3.4 additional learning needs. We're aware that there is an increase in number of pupils presented in our schools with, with ALN um, and uh, my colleague then, Kate Phillips, is, is uh, also attending these committees to talk to you about plans for um, specialist teaching facilities and other provision in the future. So the plan, I think, could identify as well where those places are, the number of places and sort of trends and, and where we need to go on projections to support our ALN pupils in, in future. And I mentioned as well about the special school consultation that we've got at the moment, so looking at special school places as well. And then we've got uh, paragraph 3.5 looking at school buildings and accessibility. 
I did mention in my last report as well that we do a number of surveys, condition surveys on schools, so we can identify those conditions. We do work hard to try and reduce the number of schools in the lower category, so conditions C and D, and that's one of our aims through our uh, Sustainable Communities for Learning programme, is to improve the condition of the buildings. Um, so I think that needs to be just be quite clear in the plan, really, what those conditions mean. So I've, I've put in the report what the conditions um, you know, sort of background to each of those condition categories. And I think that just needs to be repeated and, and sort of enhanced within the plan as well so that people know that it's not just, um, you know, sort of it, it, it's not just like a roof or a electrics or mechanics. It's, you know, it can be a combination of a lot of things that um, can change the condition of a school. So um, the age of buildings, we can note as well, although obviously, you know, we have some very, good old buildings as well in Swansea, you know, uh, and strong buildings that will probably be there for a long time as well. But it's just useful, I think, to note that we do have a varying um, stock across the, the, the council. Uh, Check three, me five... coming that point, please. Yes, go on, go on, Mike, go on, Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Kelly. Um, these obviously, the, you, within the section here, 3.5, there's obviously the main school building. Now we've got other schools, we've got schools as well with other outside buildings, demountables as we call them. Um, this obviously doesn't take in within this report there because um, I got two um, demountable buildings within Bernabe Primary, which um, are, I would say, well past their sell by date. Um, and I would like you, I would like you to, if you could, um, phone the head to to Bradford Primary Mr Knight because of the issues that we feel we got within those two buildings, the fabrics, materials within those containing those buildings. So I would be grateful if you could do that because I feel there is um, a desperate need that not only the main fabric or the main school buildings, but if you've got to utilise these buildings to provide the education for children in the community, they should also be in buildings that are fit for purpose for the for the child and also the uh, staff's health and well-being. So if if I could ask you if we would do that, please, Kelly. Yeah, can I say thank you, Mike? Um, I, I just want to ask a question about the three point five year. Um, you know, the committee is looking at the report and looking to take forward. So this is a key, of course, operational matter that you would like to be looked at. I know we can look at that separately from the meeting and Kelly will respond in a minute. But under 3.5, are we looking at school buildings and accessibility as in the actual, all of the school buildings on the school site? Yeah, that, that's a really good point, actually. We could break this down, couldn't we, into looking at which schools have got demountable and temporary um, accommodation on there as well, because that would be really useful, wouldn't it? Um, I, I, think, and, I th think so, Kelly. Yeah, I, if, yeah. if you agree, Councillor White, that a lot of schools have got these demountable buildings and some of them have been there for a very long time, but they were put up for maybe a very short period, you know, 20-year lifespan, they've been there for 40 years or whatever. I would say you're not the nail on the head, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, like, we can certainly look at that in the plan. Yeah. There we go. And and is it okay if we follow up outside the meeting? The question with Mr. Knight yeah. that we've been having. No problems. Lovely. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. Um. So three five two. This is uh, another uh, building related. Uh, item that we've got, the display energy certificates. I did mention them in a previous report as well. So every school has got one of those ratings. And obviously, energy efficiency is really key at the moment um, as we go forward as well. And um, the, the, it's interesting because the, the, the deck actually reflects usage of the building as well. So it's not just about the fabric of the building, it's about how the school is being used. So I think just, um, putting that in the plan as well will help schools to compare with each other and, and hopefully improve that rating that they've got. And then 353 then is looking at accessibility, including transport. We have had a, a workshop to look at, at transport and what we need to do with that as well and what's our statutory responsibilities. Um, so uh, I think a, a statement potentially within the plan looking at travel time to school would be useful as well, because, um, you know, when we're looking at where schools are located, you know, we don't necessarily want to have pupils traveling uh, too long on, on a vehicle to get there. 
Um, accessibility as well. We are looking at launching very soon a survey to schools on accessibility and uh, data that we gather from that survey could be included in, in the plan as well. Can I just nip in? I think yeah. it was a key point made previously in a separate meeting, Kelly, about the impact on children if they're travelling too long yeah. in, in the vehicles is a key point. So, so important. Yeah. Um, and then three, six, then vocational uh, provision, which is the last point that I've got here. Um, obviously, we are um, really keen to, to look at vocational um, and the offer in Swansea. And if we can outline what's available where in the plan, I think that would be useful. Uh, you know, we do recognise that um, the formal sort of A-level route isn't isn't necessarily for everybody. Um, and, you know, so we, we could sort of look at sort of aspirations for the future, really, and, and how that will link with our um, learners in Swansea, who are going to be our future employees and, and citizens. Uh, for Swansea, you know, at the end of the day. So I think um, to conclude my report, I think conclusions needs to be something as well that, that, that goes into the plan as well. So it's not just a set of data, you know, for people to look at, that we actually sort of make a statement about this is where we want to go and this is how we want to see our school stock in Swansea uh, going forward. Um, and as I said there in 4.2, um, my proposal is that I bring a draft of the, the plan to you at the next session. Thank you very much indeed, Kelly, for, for a very detailed and thorough report. Can I ask committee members to put their hands up on screen, please, as you want to come in and, of course, indicate in, in the room. Um, just to get things uh, going in the discussion, um, can I thank you, Councillor Smith, for and you, Helen, for setting the tone for this. This seems to be a long-term plan for the education stock to meet future needs. And what I've, I've written lots of notes down, as I always do here, and what I'm seeing is, uh, Kelly, we need a crystal ball. I mean, the, the challenges are enormous to try to project ourselves to see where the demographics are going to go over such a long period of time. Um, and I think that would be, for me, one of the, the key points coming from this is the, the challenge of understanding the, the local development plan, uh, you know, birth rates across the city and county area, and then also to try to sort of plot um, factors beyond our control. As you say, the house builders, what are their plans? Social housing, what are their plans? And how we bring all of these together. Councillor Smith. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, we, we've been um, able to predict so far in terms of pupil, the estimating pupil numbers, and that's always been fraught with, with difficulty. What I think we've got to look at now as well is, and Kelly's alluded to, to one of the issues, the number of people coming in um, uh, to work and, and study in Swansea, that's a factor. I think we need to take account of changing working patterns. Remote working is on the increase. People are no longer living where they, ne where they work necessarily. And I think people are choosing to live uh, in different areas. And I think that's something that um, could affect us. It could equally affect um, rural authorities to our west um, in terms of what, what they, they are facing. So I think, you know, the historic drift of population from, um, from the countryside into the towns and then perhaps not into all towns. And there's a variation there. That was another factor that's affected um, uh, the school population. So all of these things are, are going to be uh, in our minds as we try and uh, assess, well, what is our needs going forward? Thank you, Robert. Uh, nobody indicating at the moment. Is it again? Nobody online. Nobody online, no. Thank you, Gareth. Um, the, with the universities, I should declare an interest because I work for the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. Um, and um, uh, recruitment cycles in the universities. So, so if we miss the cycle, we get no money for the pupils. Um, I wonder whether there's any dialogue with the universities, whether they can adjust their recruitment cycles to meet with our needs. Is there any discussion along those lines? We have met with the with the university, um, and and to be fair, they are providing us with as much information as they can in advance. Um, and trying to seek more information from students on whether they are intending on bringing families with them, ages of, of children. Um, I think um, not everyone, to, you know, not everyone's accepted onto the course and, and not everyone is clear on when the families are coming in. So, but to be fair, they are working with us. And similarly, I've had a conversation with the health board as well about um, when they are getting um, cohorts of employees in from abroad as well, and they're going to um, sort of supply some information with them really about early engagement with our schools and our admissions team as well. Oh, that's good. Thank you, Kelly. 
uh, Councillor Lyndon Jones. Great, thanks, Chair, and and, th and thanks, Kelly. A really uh, a detailed report, as always, and uh, really really helpful. The point that the, the chair made, you know, really, <laughs> you do need a crystal ball because you're looking at birth rate. You're looking at if you look at my ward, for example, where property prices are going up, so people with children, young children, are less likely to be moving in. Uh, you know, so you get all sorts of things in the mix. You've got with home work, working. I, you know, we've got people in the authority I know who work who live in Pembrokeshire, Carmarthenshire, and it's much easier to do that now with home working and therefore their children could well end up by going to school locally and more people might do that so it's it really is that crystal ball um what i was going to say was with regard to uh, if we are in, in, in at some point looking at closure of schools and, and that could be on the agenda um i think one of the things we need to bear in mind with that is the if is if if we do close a school children have got further to go to school and therefore the cost uh, to the authority could be a, a lot more because we've got to bust them in and that obviously has an environmental in, impact and uh, you know also that brought in as we as Councillor Joy mentioned when we we looked at this in another committee about travel time to school again you have cost and the environmental impact on that uh, for for pupils um, uh, the other point I'd make is uh, is the provision of 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 six forms and uh, you know where they are now do we need to move that around a bit it could be a bit of a can of worms uh, but you know when you look at the the the, the six forms and all the comprehensive schools we've got maybe uh, you know that needs to be moved around uh, to accommodate uh, the points about less travel time to school and so on uh, so that's another thing that needs to be probably factored in and the the catchment area for schools i know when we have visit when the scrutiny committee have visited schools uh one of them i think dylan thomas uh, where they talked about their catchment area so i think these need to be sort of probably brought into the sort of mix as well uh, thank you thank you lyndon um who wants to respond? I've been busy scribbling down our notes of things. Yeah, no, there's a lot of things there that we could include, uh, you know, in the report, of course, and, and travel, you know, distance to schools. We would always consider that if we were looking at a school closure, at distance and, you know, and, and uh, a cost. Um, six forms, yeah, it's an interesting one as well. We can put some some data in on that and and um, size of six forms as well. And are they in the right place for sure? Obviously, we have less control over six form provision. It is funded differently. Um, it comes from a Welsh government grant, and um, we can't um, just decide we want to do something differently and set up new provision. Unfortunately, in Swansea, we have to go through the Welsh government because it all comes out of one funding pot that's shared with the college as well. So. Um, but yeah, we can certainly note uh, some things in our plan for that. Um, and yeah, ca yeah, catchment areas. Um, I think it would be worth actually having a, a plan in in our plan of of Swansea and where the catchment areas actually are, just so we can give some context to to what we're talking about. Very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon. Councillor Fiona Gordon. Fiona. Yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted to thank Kelly again as well for such a detailed report and a really good template for our, our plan going forward. Um, and I just particularly wanted to note that I'm glad that that um, turnover in schools is being included and, and that that, that churn, um, because I, I, I think it affects city centre schools, primary schools, certainly that I've been involved with in, in Castle. Uh, perhaps more than others because you get lots of movement in and out the, the city centre. I know it affects all schools, but and I know you can't predict it, but I think certain schools have always every year had um, a high level of churn and that layered on top of deprivation and additional learning needs and English as additional language. All those factors together can have a sort of cumulative effect on on yeah attainment and, and well-being and everything. So, yeah, I'm really glad that that's been included. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Councillor Robertson. Yes, endorse what Councillor Gordon has said. I think that those factors are things that need to be considered, and they certainly are being considered as as we move forward. What I would say in terms of catchment areas, um, and Kelly produced valuable information in 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 other venues 
on the position within our catchment areas. Um, the, the extent of parental choice in, specifically and the, the impact that has on where children go. Um, I think I'm not saying that catchment areas are things of the past because they're not and they, they, they are useful planning tools. But I think that is what they are really is, is a planning tool because given their movement from one catchment area to another and there, there seems to be um, a pattern where uh, schools gain, but they also lose. And, and as long as they're gaining in, in equal and, and equal and losing in equal numbers, I think that that's um, what, what's happening across most of Swansea at the moment. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. You know, people move. Um, people may choose a school for a specific reason that they got a relationship with the staff or relationship with uh, other pupils, their other parents in the school. So I think that there's so many factors there that I think we, we need to be very careful about how much uh, weight we put to catchment areas these days. Thank you very much, Robert. I, I think, especially in primary schools, um, I, I always get stuck as I, I've said previously I mean I lived quite near schools you know my kids when they were young you know and um, you know it, the, the accessibility factor was always really important for me for a lot, lot, lot of the time I didn't have a tr transport so you know the nearest school was the one we went to you know um, but but it's some very important very um, insightful areas there that's going to really add even more value to this very important report. Councillor Sandra Joy just realised. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you, Kelly, for this really comprehensive report. Um, I've got two very separate questions. Um, I'm looking at the criteria on which you're look, you know, you're setting up the SPP. One of them that I was particularly looking at is fitness for, for purpose in the sense that we do have a number of primary schools that were built rightly in a, um, a built up area to to encompass that, that area and provide facilities for children. But often the size of the footprint of the school boundary is actually quite small compared with the size of the school building. And I think we've moved on from when they were initially built that, you know, children need bigger play areas, they need more facilities, they need different things. Is that within the SPP um, that the size, the fitness for purpose or the size of the entire school area compared with the building is considered at all? Um, and then my second question is completely unrelated to that, is to do with sixth form. I have to say, I was quite taken aback to see the, um, the, the audit commission think a school sixth form of maybe size 100 is, is viable. Um, does Swansea City Council um, have their own ideas on numbers that might make a sixth form viable? If, um, you know, you're thinking about either moving, changing, opening, closing six forms. Thank you, Sandra. And yet yeah, on that point as well, audit commission is guidance, not not sort of uh, the expectation or stipulation. Uh, and, and I think that that's important. What the audit commission is producing is, yeah. is valuable, but it is a guidance to local authorities. And as Kelly said earlier, there are so many factors in relation to anything post-16, um, so many other stakeholders involved. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to put a hard and fast number on anything at the moment. You know, these these are external audit commission, valuable, but as I said, guidance is guidance at the end of the day. Thank Lovely. you for that, Robert. As I say, the thought that um, you could provide a breadth of curriculum with 50 children and 50 young people in a year 12 or a year 13, and service the rest of the school, I think, would be quite a challenge in this current climate. And, and that's and I think right. You know that, you know. I, 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 I endorse that, but what I would say yeah. as well is, you know, you look at the uh, collaboration that's going on between yeah. uh, six forms. We've got an excellent example of that. My, my own son went went through yeah. uh, that. Uh, one of those arrangements, and I think those are things that uh, we need to look at. Though their type of um, models. Um, of of good practice there, but it, that comes with a price, and I think that that's something that uh, we and Welsh government and others need to acknowledge that. Right, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Can we go back to Sandra's first question, Kelly, uh, related to uh, the footprint of the school? 
Yeah, certainly. Um, you might be aware about of building bulletin guidance. So that's guidance that um, that we use at the moment to uh, when, if we build in a new school. So we look at, um, you know, sort of uh, size of classrooms, uh, size of whole space, you know, overall sort of footprint of a school, so, you know, acreage of, of a site. So we can certainly um, compare, I think, what we've got with those building bulletin uh, guidelines. I am aware that they're looking at a review of those at some point, but I think that would give you a good starting point, because as you said, um, you know, not all schools have got the grounds. Um, I know we we um, funny enough I've, I've visited a couple of, of, of schools this week um, that don't have a lot of grounds but they are near to um, sort of parks and the beach and things like that so I think you have to take that into to context as well but yeah certainly for the plan we can put um, size of site in compared to building bulletin um, and we do look at suitability as well so you're right that you know there are some schools um, that throughout the years have been constructed differently. You know, there was a open plan schools, you know, one one stage, um, and then thoughts change. Then, isn't it? So we have to sort of work around the sort of um, the bones of what we've got in a school, really, and try and adapt that. But we do have a suitability assessment that we undertake that tries to identify that, so we can put that suitability ranking in uh, the plan as well, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Fiona, did you have your hand up? Oh, sorry, did I miss your hand just now? Sorry. It, it's fine. I was just going to um, um, uh, come to something Councillor Joy mentioned, but I think uh, Councillor Smith uh, confirmed that schools do collaborate, six forms do collaborate, so that they can offer more of a range of subjects. So you can jo perhaps join on teams or be bused from, from one six form to the other, I think. So that increases capacity. So that's good to hear that they do collaborate. Lovely. Thank you, Fiona. I can't see anyone else indicating at the moment. Um, but the other point from me on here uh, related to another sort of um, crystal ball area, really, and that's maintenance costs, building costs as well. Uh, the costs have, have seemed to have spiralled incredibly since uh, lockdown, and, and they seem to be remaining very high. In a separate context, um, mechanical and engineering replacement works uh, in a recent illustration were sort of double what they were initially estimated to be so so this is going to be a, a clear challenge for us as we plan financially looking forward is this a big concern i respond <laughs> yes please Helen. Uh, uh, thank you yeah the cost of maintaining our buildings has escalated and indeed, you know, that maintenance backlog, you know, is something that we keep under review continually. Um, so we need to be very careful, really, that, um, you know, that we have, um, you know, good business plans or uh, business cases, really, when we look at some of our buildings, because, you know, maybe the cost of maintaining them has, has overstepped the mark in one sense. And it's time or the, the time is ripe to consider a new building. So that really dovetails into the work of sustainable communities for learning. So we, we keep the buildings under review and the capital side of things and a constant review, not just in terms of um, conditions, surveys, uh, but suitability surveys as well, and also the, the general cost of maintenance. So it is kept under review. What, what I would say, Chair, and I, I endorse everything that the director has said, um, but we are looking at how we can build capacity to do more uh, ourselves and, and, and uh, we're looking at things like apprenticeships, uh, the tr training programmes within the council. Um, traditionally, our local authorities have been uh, important providers of apprenticeships and, and have built uh, their own capacity and I think that's something we may well and are doing uh, to, to give ourselves uh, an additional scope to undertake some of this work, but yes, it is a it's a huge uh, concern, uh, escalating costs affecting not just new bills, but as has been said, uh, the maintenance program as well. And I think that's um, come through in the last three or four years very strongly. Thank you very much both. Um, and I'm not asking, I'm always concerned about overburden, any overburden, but I wonder whether we've got a, a, any information from the accountants about sort of maintenance costs, whether there's a budget line over the last couple of years. So we can see these. In my experience as a school governor, and I'm sure all of us have had this experience, 
we, we've seen them rise and rise and rise again. So it seems eminently sensible, as Councillor Smith says, to consider our capacity as a council to be able to do more of this work in-house and link that to our vocational offer through our schools so that we're giving kids something to lose early on, 12, 13-year-olds who, who don't want to follow academic career paths, can, can look ahead towards an apprenticeship and uh, to look ahead at a... At a an opportunity within within the council structure. I mean, that's a great opportunity for us. We could turn that threat into something very positive, perhaps. So can I thank you all? No one's indicating to, to say anything else here in the room or online. Um, can I thank you for that? Uh, again, as ever, brilliant insight to add a value to what was an excellent and insightful report. So thank you very much indeed, Kelly for that. So moving forward forward onto the agenda, we've got number five, which is the work plan for 2023 to 2024. So our next uh, session is planned for the 13th of December, transforming additional learning needs. Then we have Right Schools, Right Places, 24th of January, where we see Kelly again. And then six of March, transforming additional learning needs. And then we'll have our end of year report on the 17th of April. So, so that seems very uh, logical, very sensible and very full, which is, is great. Um, next meeting, Wednesday, the 13th of December. Could I make a suggestion, um, uh, everyone? Could I suggest that this could be held on Teams? It's the middle of December. Shopping panic is starting to kick in and, and all sorts of pressures on our time there. So if you were content, would it be OK if we held this meeting on Teams in December? Are we happy, committee? Yeah, OK. I thought you were going to suggest the pub then, Mike. Hey, if, if, well, well, there we are. Well, there's a suggestion. <laughs> I mean, always up for that, Fiona. I mean, we, we, oh, everyone's we second, third, and fourth to that suggestion. Um, so, teams on the 30th of December, if that's okay. Um, can I thank you all for your commitment and your insight and and uh, and what I think was a very valuable uh, foundation in what is an open and transparent approach to taking our school estate into the future. And, and that is really heartening. It's going to transform and add value to the lives of so many thousands of kids in the future. And on that point, I will close the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.